All right. Um, I'm sure as we as we the training progresses, um, more folks will be joining. But for the sake of time, because we roughly have uh, 90 minutes for this presentation, we are going to get started now. Um, once again, this is the targeting corporations through digital campaigns training uh, put on by some of us. Um, just a quick introduction as to who we are and what some of us does. Uh, my name is Tony Preston. She, her pronouns. I'm a U.S. senior campaigner um, at some of us. Some of us is a global corporate accountability watchdog group, a lot of words I know, um, with roughly 18 million people from around the world taking actions on a daily basis. Uh, I will be one of your co-trainers today and I'm gonna toss it to my other co-trainer uh, to introduce himself. Hello everybody, thanks for making it. It's really exciting to be here. My name is Fatah, if you can say the H the Arabic way. If you cannot, call me Fatah or any other Western way, I won't uh, be mad at it. Um, I pronounce it he, uh, his, he, him. Um, and I'm based in the northern suburb of Paris, France. I've been with some of us for a bit over six years and I'm a campaigns manager here, campaigning in both French and English on global issues, including climate and deforestation. Awesome, thanks, Vata. Okay, so before we jump into the training fully, just uh, a couple of reminders. First being that the session, this session is recorded. So if you don't want um, your image or your voice um, to be included in the recording, please stay off camera and be sure that you're on mute. Um, closed captioning is available for this presentation. Um, so if you're on try to access that, I believe it's on the bottom bar of your Zoom right next to the record button. So you click on that and you should be good to go. Um, you all should already have access to the presentation, but we'll also share that presentation again with you all like once the training is over. Um, when prompted, if you wanna speak, simply write stack um, in the Zoom chat. That is basically an indicator to Fata and I that there is an op basically you want to come off mute to say something out loud. Um, there is a dedicated Q&A portion um, towards the end of the training, so we ask that you kind of like reserve your questions until the end. Um, and because, you know, timing is tight, um, when you do have the opportunity to, you know, uh, come off mute to say out loud whatever um, responses you want to give to a prompt, try to be as concise as possible, um, just for the sake of time. And as always, if we're speaking too fast, just let us know, tell us to slow down in the chat. And if you can't hear us clearly, just tell us to speak up and we'll do both of those things accordingly. Um, so that's just some of the reminders and housekeeping things for today's training. And with that, let's get started. Um, so for today's roadmap, in terms of what to expect, um, there are gonna be three sections to this training. Um, the first will cover strategy and tactics. The next session will cover anti-oppression. And then the third, as promised, is the Q&A portion, followed by the next steps. So to begin, um, the first thing we'll like you all to answer is what's a campaign? And so for this, we're gonna give you all five minutes. We're gonna utilize the breakout room feature. So we're gonna split you up into uh, pairs, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, in pairs. Um, and at the beginning of this, um, just introduce yourself to your partner, just get acquainted with them. Uh, feel free to you know, say your name, pronouns are optional, um, and then answer that particular prompt. What's a campaign? And then after five minutes, uh, we'll come back and then um, hear some of your responses. So give us one second to just get like the breakout room sorted. While well, we get the breakout room sorted again, just introduce yourself to your pair and then, you know, chat and try to answer the, end, the question, what's the campaign according to you? You should find yourselves in a um, split group soon. Awesome, I think folks are coming back from the breakout rooms. Welcome back everyone. Um, so now we're going to have um, five minutes for some report back. So if you like to share out loud, um, basically what the definition you came up with with your pair in terms of what a campaign is, please stack in the Zoom chat or you can type your responses um, in the Zoom chat as well and we'll just read them out loud. So can we have two or three volunteers basically, um, yeah, give their response in terms of what a campaign is. And do try to be, just for the sake of time, like as concise as possible.
also I love the commodity going on in the, in the yep. chat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and there are no wrong answers, obviously. Okay, Sybil, I'm hoping I'm saying your name correctly. If I'm not, please correct me. Um, you said our group came up with a campaign is an organized effort to challenge power in a concrete and measurable way. Yes, nice. that is a good definition. Anyone else? Leonila, Leonella, a plan to win a specific challenge, policy, or practice. Nika, a campaign is a process by which you identify a goal, targets, timelines, and tactics, et cetera, to achieve that goal. Yes. We mainly talked about the benefits and challenges of organizing slash campaigning digitally, specifically with COVID. Campaigns can be educational or misinformational. Yeah. Grace and I talked about types of campaigns from organizing in person to digital to building relationships. Yes, these are all, all really great responses. And in fact, cover basically like what a campaign is. So before I move on um, to the next section, just to give a baseline um, definition, because a lot of the responses already encompass this, I'm going to leave the, the Zoom chat open for one more minute, just in case anyone has a burning urge. See, look at that, shout out to Alex. Uh, a campaign's intentional and organized effort towards long-term goals with specific strategies and tactics. Yes. What are we doing here, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All these great answers. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know at this point. But yes, these are all really great answers. Uh, thank you all for typing them out in the, in the Zoom chat and for participating. Um, you all basically answer what a campaign is, but I'm just gonna go through and you know, cover one more time. So yeah, campaigns are about power and influence and power. Um, a campaign is sustained effort towards a specific goal. It inspires people to take continued action while helping them understand the depth of the issue to create real change. What a campaign is not, it's not a single one-off action. So how is that, how does that compare to digital campaigns, right? A digital campaign simply uses digital tools, platforms, and tactics to create change. So it's like any campaign, but it's digital. It makes it easier to shift power. And although corporations still have a lot of power, like let's be real, it makes the power imbalance less extreme because online together, similar to like when you organize in, you know, in your communities, you can mobilize a lot of people online and that in itself can be very powerful. So with that basic definition in mind, we're going to talk about strategy and tactics, because the truth is, uh, without strategy and tactics, you can't run a digital campaign. And so right now we're going to go through the basics of building strategy using a Some of Us campaign as a case study and then look into those tactics that we used. And you will also have an opportunity, just an FYI, to know like what's coming to share some of the cool tactics you're either utilizing right now with the work that you do, um, or you're a big fan of some of the tactics that you might see other groups have been doing and we can start to like collect, do some collective intelligence um, to uplift some of those tactics. Next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. So what is a campaign strategy? A campaign strategy, well, it's a tool to turn the resources you have into the power you need to obtain the change that you want. A campaign strategy, it's also a plan of action designed to achieve the overall aim in your campaign. And so on this slide, uh, you will see basically, it's a chart, but, it's, but if you look at it, you'll see that every action is escalating towards a goal. So a campaign strategy helps you understand how you will build power over the course of the campaign and plan in every step from the now until the goal is achieved. I'll, so, I'll just let that one a bit longer yeah. just so people have time to, to see it. Thank you. So like anything in life, um, when it comes to you know campaign strategy, a bit of prep definitely goes a long way because then you can anticipate moments where you might surge or you know like how your target might respond to something and already have like a counter plan in, in, in action for that. And so having said all of that, I'm gonna toss it right now to Fata to present you all that case study to basically put those pieces together around campaign strategy and tactics. So Fata, over to you. 
Thank you, Tony. Um, so basically what we'll do here before I start is we will look at, you know, kind of pretending like we're building that strategy, pretending like we're doing the prep work based on a real life case, a case study of a campaign we ran. Um, and the case study we'll use is the PepsiCo Palmo campaign we did run for five years. Uh, we've now won the campaign, so it's in the past. So you'll see some of the languages in the past, and some of it is in the present for things that are still relevant. Now you may wonder why these products, the drinks, the snacks, the chips. So this slide here describes some of the drinks, some of the snacks, some of the chips, the Frito-Lay brand chip chips, uh, some of the canned soda, all these products are PepsiCo products. And so if you wonder why are we even talking about PepsiCo and palm oil, that's because PepsiCo buys palm oil and in a lot of the brands it has, uses palm oil to manufacture the snacks that it sells across the globe. So uh, let me tell you a bit about this palm oil campaign. Um, and then, you know, we'll move into looking at the strategy and how it applied to, to PepsiCo and hopefully learn together some things about how we build a strategy for a digital campaign targeting a corporation. So basically, PepsiCo, like many snack food companies, buys palm oil, right? Um, what is wrong with palm oil? Well, palm oil is usually, in most cases, especially 10 to 15 years ago, uh, produced in a very unsustainable way, um, destroying very precious ecosystems, using deforestation, but also exploiting workers, communities, doing land grabs, uh, and pushing endangered species to the brink of extinction. So, uh, what we thought with partners, specifically Rainforest Action Network, which also has a presentation during the convergence, uh, so this is very exciting, was that, you know, going after some of the big brands would allow us to change the industry, right? So, we decided to go after PepsiCo. So this is why uh, we had a campaign against PepsiCo asking PepsiCo to do better on palm oil. So let's look at, at the strategy. Um, so PepsiCo or not, when you're doing strategy building, there are three key questions you can ask yourself that will really help you and steer your strategy in the right direction. First is, what do companies care about? Second, what do you have yourself, your group, your organization, your neighborhood, your community to influence them. Third, why is the target, so the company, not already doing what you want it to do? So once you've answered these questions, you have a very good idea already of what you can do. So let's apply the questions to PepsiCo and see what the answers are. So on the first question, what does PepsiCo care about? This one is in the present because I still believe they care about the very same thing they cared about five years ago. The first one, as with most corporations, or all corporations, Business, money, you know, the bottom line. This is what they are for. This is why they exist. So this is their main, main, main focus. This is their priority, business. Then in the case of a company like PepsiCo, but in the case of most companies involved in a campaign that will be around climate issues, will be green, ethical, positive image. And the money they put into looking green and ethical. Uh, third, and we realized this by doing some research, was shareholders for PepsiCo. They really care about their shareholders. Um, there is a strong shareholder culture in this company. Not the case for every company, but in this case it was, it was true and we realized it. And finally, it's CEO and the little smiley is there to say that we didn't know that up front and it's not always the case. We realized that as we went with the campaign and I'll tell you the story of this later in this um, presentation. Second question was, what did we have to influence PepsiCo? We had a bunch of things. And that made us very powerful. Remember, campaign is about power and shifting power. We had a lot of power when we combined all the things we had. But some of us, we had a global network of members, around 18 million members all around the globe, speaking uh, in the operational languages we use back then three languages, then we moved to four, we're close to five languages now, and hopefully we'll get to 10 uh, in the coming years or two. We had digital tools, very, very digital tools. We had something called the cold tool. A cold tool was a website that very easily accessible you would just put your phone number and we would put you in touch with the target you could talk to them uh, and tell them what you wanted them to do so that was a great organizing tool we had a twitter tool built in-house which allowed us to create twit storms within a few clicks uh, allowing us to flood twitter and to do hashtag takeovers and stuff like this uh, 
Our CRM, which is basically our mailing platform, allowed us to contact our members via email. And we had a, a bunch of other digital tools as we're a digital first organization. Then we had consumer power. And that consumer power came from our global network of members because a lot of those members are basically consumers of various brands, but they were also consumers of Pepsi products. We had shareholder power as we were able to have some of our members self-identify as shareholders of PepsiCo. We had very powerful partners and experts, some on the ground, some just experts in the field. And I'm going to again shout out to RAN, Rainforest Action Network, with whom this campaign originated and who has been our partner all through the, the campaign. And we've followed their expertise. Um, and what made them powerful was their expertise, really. We had worker power as we were partnering with on the ground unions of workers in Palmo plantations, but also PepsiCo workers in various plants uh, across the world. And we had media relations, just because of the nature of the work we do, we've built relationship with journalists and media and they follow the stories um, we develop with them. Finally, why was Pepsi not already sourcing clean palm oil by the time we started the campaign and we were looking at building the strategy? Well, there are a few reasons. They didn't care. Honestly, they didn't care because it didn't affect their business. And remember, business is the first thing they care about. So if it doesn't affect business, they don't care. And the reason why it didn't really affect their business back then is because consumers didn't know. And Palmo wasn't yet a big story worldwide. So that is kind of a cluster of reasons. And then another set of reasons was it would cost too much. Obviously, they knew they were buying Palmo and they knew they had a risk assessment probably done at their level and they knew problems could arise, but it would cost too much to do something meaningful. So because they didn't affect the business and they didn't care, they were like, we're not going to do anything. And finally, it was a bit complicated for them. They didn't really know where to start. And this is something we hear a lot from, from corporate targets. It costs a lot of money and we don't really know where to start. And so it's not really our role to do this. Where these, these were the reasons we identified why PepsiCo didn't do anything yet. So here we looked at the three questions and how they applied to the PepsiCo case, right? A quick note on prep that is really universal. You know, when you do your prep and you start doing your research, look at the existing information available on the issue. Internet is a great tool for this. And, you know, uh, for as long as you're in a place where internet access is easy, uh, you will be able to find most of the information you need as publicly available information online. Then for the rest, you can talk to the people who are already working on it. You know, by, you know, looking a bit, you'll start figuring out that some people are working on it. Some people have presented on it. Some people, you know, some names come back often. You can, and you have to talk to the affected communities and affected people as early as possible. They're the, you know, first person to talk to because they're the first person who are affected by whatever is happening. And you can reach out to potential partners and experts, and these could be part of the two aforementioned categories. They can be people who are already working on it that you want to join, like we did with RAN, or they can just be people you know would be great at it and you form a partnership to work on something. So these are general tips on this, uh, but again, this plus the three questions will guide you and, and really get you going with, okay, I'm starting to see something there and, and make a choice around starting a campaign. So this is kind of theoretical and, and, you know, we've answered a few questions, but that doesn't make a strategy. So what does the Pepsi strategy look like? Well, we'll look at this right now. We have six items and we'll focus on five of them. I'll go through them here in this, in this slide, and then we'll go through them one by one and apply the PepsiCo case to them. So first in the strategy, you have the goal. You can only have one goal. You cannot have two, three. If you have two or three goals, you have either two or three campaigns or you have a set of objectives, but not, a goal is the final goal of your campaign. If you remember that chart we saw earlier with escalation, the goal is the final, the aim, the destination of your campaign. Uh, so what's the overall goal you're trying to achieve? This is the goal. Then you have objective, objectives actually. You can have one if it's a very easy campaign. We can have many if it's a campaign that's a bit more convoluted with more things to do along the way. It is basically one needs to happen to achieve your goal then the power analysis needs to be in the strategy. Without that, it's very complicated to know where to hit. So who's your target? What moves the target? Who has influence over the target? Why is the target not moved yet? All these questions are usually answered by the power analysis. And we'll do one for PepsiCo in this exercise. Then you have the theory of change. Uh, some of you might know what it is. Some of you might not. So it might be a refresher or a brand new thing for you, or you may have heard of it, like the legend of the theory of change. 
big word for something very simple. It's a theory of how we think we can change the existing situation using the, the things we have to play with. So the power we already have, how do we use that power to change the situation? So we create a theory with that and we follow through. The story is the one we're not going to focus on because the story just comes in quite naturally with the issue usually, and it would take another full training to talk about storytelling and to be honest, to talk about anything. Strategy could be another hour and a half, but you know, we try to make things coherent and, and, and condensed enough so that we can talk about them, uh, but also going deep enough so that it can be helpful. This, basically, if you have a clear story, a clear tale to tell the members or the followers or the you know, community members, whatever group you have, you're trying to organize around this, the clearer the story, the stronger the story, the easier it is to take them from now to the final goal. And finally, we'll look at tactics, creative tactics. They are the activities that will pressure the target to do what we want. And we think of escalation, if you remember. Tactic one will escalate to tactic two, which will escalate to tactic three, et cetera, et cetera. And between tactics or objectives, each tactic should escalate you to the next objective. So let's start with the goal. What did we want is the question that is answered by the goal. We wanted PepsiCo to stop sourcing what we call conflict palm oil. Conflict palm oil is palm oil that has been produced illegally or under conditions associated with labor or human rights violations, ongoing destruction of rainforest or expansion on carbon-rich peatland. And carbon-rich peatland, to make it very short, are very precious ecosystems that are great tools in the fight against um, climate chaos. So that is the goal. We wanted PepsiCo to stop sourcing conflict palm oil. Then we have the objectives. We have a few objectives actually. It's what needed to happen for us to get what we wanted. These are the steps along the way with escalation that take us to the final goal, the final victory, what we wanted. First, PepsiCo needed to adopt a cross commodity. Cross commodity means everything they source. NDPE, sourcing policy. NDP is no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation. Not super important for you here, but it just means that it's a comprehensive sourcing policy that protects both the environment and the people and was back then the gold standard of what we wanted companies to do well. This was it. Then it needed to happen at the company group level and include third party partners. Company group level means it applies to all the companies and all the brands in the PepsiCo group. Because something you will hear often from targets like this one is, oh, but it's complicated. We have a franchise system. We have a global network of, yes. And that's why you need to make it happen globally and at the group company level. Then we had to make sure that the ties between PepsiCo and the conflict palm oil that we're sourcing were crystal clear. There needed to be no doubt about the fact that, yes, PepsiCo was buying dirty palm oil and that PepsiCo was complicit in what was happening. That way, we would change public perception of PepsiCo. That was a necessary step. And finally, another step we wanted to have along the way was for the CEO, the board, and the C-suite, so all the execs of the company, to be embarrassed, to be bothered, to not like the situation. That's the only reason why they would do something. If it's bothering them, then they do something. And they're the people in power. And you'll see what we see that with the power analysis. So then power analysis. Before we dive into doing it, quick explainer on what it is. And you can always come back to this presentation as a resource uh, to use for, for you to build campaigns or if you need a refresher, this will be with you and you'll have it. So who's your target? Who does your target listen to? You make a list of that and then you do a power map. Pretty simple. So we know who the target is. This is the power mapping. We have allies on one side in green and we have under the red um, header, the opponents. So on the allies, we have RAN, Rainforest Action Network, partner organization. We have OPUC. OPUC is the Indonesian Palm Oil Workers Union we were working with. We have Manga Bay, which is an environmental publication that you probably know, and other environmental media, shareholder groups, consumers, although you know, consumers are not always with you, but in this case, it was easy to make the case for, to consumers that this was a bad story. The RSPO, I put it as an ally, although I'm very critical of that organization, is the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. It's a self-declared regulator on palm oil that is made by the industry for the industry. But you know, it was more an ally than an opponent. And then we had the general public as an ally. On the opponent side, we had the board and the CEO. We had the execs, the C-suite. We had Indofood, which was a joint venture partner, a business partner of 
Pepsi, but also a palm oil producer sourcing palm oil for PepsiCo. We had the Indonesian government who's making money out of that. We had producers and traders also making money out of the situation and loved the status quo. And we had the SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, because PepsiCo is an American company and we were challenging the company at its AGM. So anything that has to do with AGM's annual general meeting of shareholders, shareholders and all that goes through the SEC. So the SEC is an opponent because the rules are quite tough for us to be able to, to play in that, that game and to be at the adult stable, I would say, with them. So this is a basic power mapping tool. Other tools exist, and I'm going to add them to the resources I will share with you after this presentation. This is the one I chose to use today because this is the one I use often. Uh, and you can use that one as a template. It's empty. And magically, it will be filled with the paramapping of people that are on you know, the spectrum. So the vertical spectrum is from the bottom least influential to the top most influential. And the horizontal spectrum in yellow goes from to the left opposing and to the right support. People who are allies are in green or opponents are in red. Logically, you know, on the opposing side is our opponents, on the supporting side is our allies. And you see that the people with the most influence are not our allies. Doesn't mean we don't have power. We still have power. If you look at, you know, we still have people that are close to most influential. The shareholder groups ran because it had already built a relationship with PepsiCo in the campaign and it had, you know, all the expertise and, and legitimacy that it has. Consumers were great allies of us, of ours with a lot of influence because obviously the bottom line is directly impacted. And it, we remember what we said, PepsiCo cared about the money. This is really what they care about, despite what they say. They care about the money first. Um, and, you know, on the most influential and not on our side, we had the CEO, the board, and the exec. And we really decided to focus on that because it was, you know, the trifecta we really wanted to, to move. So that takes us to the theory of change. What is a theory of change? Quick definition. It's a cause and effect sequence that shows how your objectives will lead to achieving your aim. Aim here can be replaced by a goal. It's in, you know, you can change that, that for, for, for goal. So basically it's a cause and effect sequence that shows how your objectives, you know, the steps will lead to achieve your goal. And it has a very simple structure. It's a sentence that does if X, then Y. And so for Pepsi, it looked like this. If we damage PepsiCo's brand enough to threaten its business, remember this is what they care about the most, then it will take action to stop sourcing conflict palm oil, which was our goal. Remember the goal was get Pepsi to stop sourcing conflict palm oil. If your goal is not in the theory of change, something's wrong, probably need to rework it. And usually you also can have what the target cares the most about there. Here we have it. PepsiCo is brand enough to threaten its business. We have a beautiful formula of what they care the most, what we're going to do to it, and how we will force them to take action on what the goal is for us. So this is a theory of change. You should be quite short and explain your campaign um, in, a, in a succinct way. Now let's go to the tactics, which is the last thing we'll look at uh, on the strategy. Um, before we look at the tactics, we use a few words on tactics. Tactics to be effective, to be fitting to your campaign, need to be based on your earlier analysis of what moves the target. Otherwise, you're you know, doing tactics for nothing. If your tactics are not impacting what moves the target, you won't get to your objectives. And if you don't get to your objectives, you don't get to the final goal. You don't get to the end of the road. The tactics will help you reach your objectives, like I said, and they should include an escalation strategy. What it means is the target needs to feel the heat with every new tactic. You know, things need to get worse and worse and worse for them. And finally, when you develop your tactics, play to your strengths. We all have different strengths and fortes. Um, but don't hesitate to be creative. Try to think out of the box. Usually that works very well because then you do things that they're not expecting you to do. Let's now look at the tactics we've used in the Pepsi uh, campaign. We started with petitions. This is what we're known for. If you already knew some of us, you probably know us because of that. You receive our 
campaigns in the form of petitions in your inbox. Um, and this is kind of the entry point for our campaigns. This is how we start the engagement ladder, if you think about escalation. So petitions. And you know, petitions have varied over time. It's been a five year long campaign, so we've had many petitions. Various targets over time to fit the needs of the campaign. We also had Facebook and social media actions where we asked our members and supporters to just go and flood the Facebook walls, the Twitter pages of the target and just, you know, ask them to take action. We have tweet storms, which, you know, were designed to look like genuine conversation on Twitter. Um, technology has permitted that in, the, in recent years. It's been better and better um, where we were able to take over hashtags, but also have a multiplicity of, of tweets uh, be tweeted by our members and sort of all go in the same direction. We've used videos a lot. We have an in-house video producer, but you don't have to. A smartphone with a camera allows you to make great videos today. So we made spoof ads, we made parody of like behind the scenes, and you'll see what I'm talking about, you know, when I talk about videos, and we've made short social media clips to be shared on Facebook, on Instagram, etc. Videos can be used on any platform that accepts videos. We've done reports and shared them online based on research that we've commissioned. We've done product launch hijacking um, and we've done pension fund actions. Pension fund actions means that we've used the tool that we built where we asked our members to go online and either call or have an automatic message going through their pension, pension fund managers when they had a pension fund and asking the pension fund manager to vote in favor of our shareholder proposal at the annual general meeting. So this is kind of, when we were doing it, it was, it was never seen before and, and kind of like shifted power in a dramatic way on the shareholder activism part of the work we were doing. So let's look at what some of these tactics look like. Um, I'm going to describe kind of what you see on the phones, but these are petition pages from some of us on the PepsiCo campaign. Um, you know, we've had many petitions against Pe uh, PepsiCo over the year, although it's the same campaign. These are a few of them. If you look, these are 200,000 strong, 200,000 strong. It's almost 100K. This is another 210,000 signatures. And this focuses really on the main story, the environment and the empty promises and PepsiCo. And then, Okay, here's another 100,000 signatures, another 100,000 signatures, another 19, 000, you know, 1900, and then another 150, and you see that it starts to shift. There's a change of focus. Uh, maybe some of you will recognize her. This is Andrew Nuyi, um, corporate extraordinaire and former CEO of PepsiCo. She became our prime target with time. And what I want to show here is that strategies evolve and change over time. She wasn't a target at first, but after four years, we realized that she was the one we needed to talk to and she was the one we needed to embarrass. So, you know, it changed over time. We realized that power was concentrate, concentrated with her. So strategies evolve based on context. They evolve based on new information you might get, right? They evolve based on new partnerships. If you look at the phone that's second from the left, it's a open letter from moms living in the same area as Indranui talking to her. And we made just new contacts and new partnerships, so we decided on a new strategy, right? Wedge victories can be an opportunity for a refocusing of the strategy. A wedge victory is when you don't get the full picture you wanted, but you get part of it. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to use this and jump from it to get to the next step. A response from the target can be another way to also rethink your strategy. So you have many opportunities to change it, and a strategy doesn't have to be sort of fixed. It is a living... Thing. It is a living document. If it's a document, it's a living thing that you need to go back to often, especially as your campaign lasts. So, and this is the last petition we did as they changed CEO. Um, it didn't change our strategy. We kept on going after the CEO. Petitions alone engaged more than a million people over five years. I think it's way more than a million. Um, it's almost 1.5 million people. And we use petition both to kick off and launch the campaign. Like I said, we use this as an entry point. We also used it as a tactic just to escalate. Like I said, tactics should escalate. And this was an escalation tactic going from, please PepsiCo do better to you've done a bit better. Now you need to do much better. And to, hey, Indra, stop blocking this. You're the one person who's blocking this. This is escalation, right? So this is how we use petitions. 
we also used video, as I said. So we had 20 million views on this. Maybe you've seen it. It's been seen by a lot of people, as I said. Um, everybody, or more humbly, a lot of people talked about it. <laughs> um, and the most important thing is this prompted a response from Pepsi. For the first time, they named us, some of us, and they responded. Although we, we, we weren't in agreement with what they were saying, they were engaging publicly with us, right? Before that, they were only engaging with our partners ran on a private basis. So I'm going to play it. It's only 45 seconds long, and I'd enjoy watching it again. And I think if you've never seen it, you'll probably enjoy it. Let's go. Fun, you could see our old logo. Well, we're not the first people who've done videos, uh, but this one worked really well. So, you know, we used videos, we used different formats. This is a more produced video than others we've done. It costs a lot more money, but we've also done tiny short videos that cost $20 to make, and they still worked. This is another one I wanted to show you. I've talked about product launch hijacking. So what you see here on this slide is a fake computer screen, but inside that fake computer screen <laughs> is a real screenshot of the Amazon page for Pepsi True. Pepsi True, I don't know if it still exists, maybe in the US, I don't know. Uh, but it was an attempt by Pepsi to do a greener soda drink based off a of stevia versus just corn sugar or regular sugar, beet sugar. So it was stevia, so it had that whole green image, and we were very upset about it because we know that Pepsi isn't green, and it wasn't green at that time, especially. So when we learned that they were launching this and they were launching it on Amazon, we asked their supporters and members to go and put one star review. You probably cannot see it, so I'm gonna describe this, but if you zoom in, the, the review of the product is one star, and it's 1,500 people who said that. Basically, we bombed their um, product launch, and it was a disaster for them. Uh, it made the news of all the, um, trust me, it exists, what I'm going to say exists, the bakery and snacks <laughs> media <laughs> that exists. <laughs> it also made the news of, you know, the um, ad uh, and media-focused uh, press. And most importantly, they removed the product, time for them to bring it back with a clean slate on, on rating. Uh, you know, we did well with that in the sense that it made them upset. And what we wanted was to affect the bottom line, if you remember on the objectives, and to make them upset. And talking about making them upset, we published a report. This was 2018. We had commissioned this report. And that report, we don't need to go into depth, but it basically shows that Pepsi was aware and complicit in a lot of environmental destruction and uh, human rights violations related to palm oil production um, in Indonesia. And so this report made the news, you know, people talked about it, but most importantly, we had the confirmation when we went to an annual general meeting from a VP of sustainability that Indra Nooyi herself, the CEO, the all powerful boss, had a printed version of it on her desk. She was very mad about it. If she's mad, the person who were getting the fire or the exec, the board, the C-suite. So, we kind of did what we wanted. We made all these powerful people in the org who have the influence over the decisions embarrassed, upset, and in a bad position. So they would do something, right? So this was a great way for us to advance uh, the negotiations we had with the partner on this. So now that I've told you a bit about the tactics, some of the tactics focused on some of them, uh, let's do a quick thing where, you know, we've talked about post-its. I'm going to paste a link um, Sorry, let me just get it. Yeah, there it is. I'm pasting a link in the Zoom chat. There it is. It's a link to this presentation. And I invite you to go to slides starting in slide 40, 40. I'm going to type it as well. 
if you go to, if you go to slide 40, you will see a bunch of post-it notes. And what I want you to do is take five minutes first to just go and, you know, you just mute if you're not muted and like pick a post-it note. There should be like 70 or 90 of them. I can make more if needed. You just pick a post-it note and you put a memorable tactic there. What is a tactic you loved? What is a tactic you've seen? It can be digital. It can be in real life. It can be from you, your org, someone you know, your friends, your school, or someone you don't know. You have seen on TikTok, Twitch. You've seen it, you know, wherever you've seen it. Put the cool tactics in there. And then once you've done that for five minutes, uh, we'll open the floor for five-ish minutes for people to, you know, share whatever tactic they, they, they want to talk about if they want. And the cool thing is after this, you'll have kind of database of tactics that you can come back to. Very cool tactics shared by all the people who are on this presentation. So um, it's 23 past the hour. Let's do this until 28, 29 past the hour. I'll call you back by speaking up. And so, yeah, uh, access the uh, presentation, go to slide 40, starting slide 40, and just feel whatever post-it you have in front of you with a cool tactic you remember and you want to share with everybody. And you won't have to share it uh, by voice, but, you know, it will be there for people to access if they need ever. I don't say anything, so I just want to make sure people can access the it's presentation. Open. Oh, cool, because I can yeah. see it. Thank you, Tony. Okay, let's... Um, come back uh, to the shared screen on Zoom where I share the presentation. Uh, thank you for sharing on the post-its. Are there one, two, or three people who want to stack and maybe um, take the mic and share about a tactic they've written down, something that you think is memorable or super cool? Yes, Latifa. Thank you. Um, I put down the using the this you meme format against corporations whenever they post um, something, especially on Twitter that tries to like downplay um, or completely like obscure their shitty behavior. I really like that tactic because it's so simple. It's so effective at achieving um, what you want to do when you call out corporations, which is to expose the fact that um, they lie about shit all the time. And it's just, it's very relevant. And like, even if you're not like super deep into like meme culture or pop culture, whatever it is, like you can just instantly get um, the impact and the intention of calling them out in that way. Um, so that's one, one tactic that I really like. Yeah, great, thanks. And the cool thing about that is, unlike in the real world, it gives us, digital gives us a direct access to the company, to the target. Even if it's through, you know, community manager, whatever, it's someone who works for the company. So ultimately, you know, you're directly communicating with them. Um, someone else wants to maybe share uh, one of the tactics? It's okay, well, so the tactics that are on the post-its here, you know, this presentation you have now with you, I will still share it again in the resources I share with you after, and you can always come back to them. Um, and I also made a list of the tactics we've used, but some of us more generally. So you can see here, some are online, some are offline, and you might wonder, offline? We're talking about digital. Well, offline becomes digital very easily. Offline becomes digital very easily. All you have to do, you know, is digitize it in some way and one very easy way to do this when it comes to things that are happening outside offline in the real world is to take powerful images photo video you can live stream something and all of a sudden 
it becomes digital and also it becomes accessible to many, many more people. Um, yes, Alex, I'll keep that question for the, for the Q and A, but I have an answer to that. Um, and so live stream, you can share those images widely. So anything that becomes digital can be shared very easily and widely and most of the time for free. If you have a network of partner, you can ask them to amplify a share for you as well. And one cool thing you can do because you don't have to be a press agency to do it is write a PR and contact journalists on Twitter and, you know, send them whatever you have that's a digital asset of an offline action. So that's why I've also spoken about offline. Um, and now I will uh, give it to Tony um, because we'll talk about anti-oppression, like we said earlier in the roadmap. We just saw the basics of strategy building and tactics, um, you know, that we use to create change and have impact online. But if we're working towards, you know, more than just impact, if we're working towards liberation, equity and inclusivity, then we need to think about anti-oppression. So Tony, to you. Merci. Um, okay, so let's talk about anti-oppression. First things first, uh, what definitions have you heard for the words oppression and anti-oppression? So for that, you can either stack, um, you know, to say your response out loud, or you can just type your response in the Zoom chat and I'll happily read them out loud. So yeah, what definitions have you heard for the words oppression? And what definition have you heard for the word anti-oppression? Structural racism. What else? Abuse of power towards marginalized communities, yes. And one more, if anyone wants to take a stab at it. Inequities and injustices, yes. Um, those are all great responses, right? Um, so just, again, apply that foundation in terms of making sure we're operating with the same definition. Uh, what's oppression? Uh, well, oppressions are the systems, policies, and norms, explicit and implicit, that create inequality amongst people, often based on our identities. Oppression happens internally, interpersonally, institutionally, and structurally. And the key thing to always remember, and I'm sure many of you all are aware of this as well, is that oppression is rooted in domination, exploitation, and extraction. So if that's oppression, what's anti-oppression? Well, anti-oppression work seeks to recognize the oppression that exists in our society and attempts to mitigate its effects and eventually equalize the power imbalance in our communities. So you might be wondering how does this apply to corporate campaigns and the work we do? I'll tell you how. So corporate power is a system of personal, positional, and institutional oppression, right? Benefiting corporations and private interest. So on the slide, you see that corporate power is a system of oppressions, like I said, benefiting corporations. And so the work that we do in terms of weaving in anti-owner campaigns, um, that is because corporate campaigns with anti-O framings aim to shift that power to those who are oppressed. And so you might have remembered when I said, um, the key to building good strategies and tactics is that a bit of preparation goes a long way. It's the same thing when it comes to making sure that you know you're thinking about anti-oppression um, in the work that you do in terms of like grassroots organizing or being digital campaigns. And so the what you're seeing on the slide right now are just a couple of questions that we ourselves and some of us as campaigners will ask ourselves in terms of like what campaigns that we choose and the best approach for them. So in terms of doing the prep, you know, which topics do you choose are questions we all often ask ourselves, which criteria do we use? or which other sources could we use um, when doing our research? So similarly, once we already have like the campaign idea in mind, we're thinking about, you know, what narrative do we want to tell our members? That's where storytelling comes into play, right? And the questions that we'll ask ourselves are, what's our angle? Is there an anti ill angle that you can include, even if it's not your main angle? Um, and you'll see what we mean a bit more when Fata like talks about the PepsiCo campaign again, and how he's kind of incorporated uh, anti ill uh, in that regard. Which language should you use or not use? When should you include a content warning? And is your framing or narrative empowering? So shifting from the storytelling bit, now we have on the visual content. Um, for example, some of the questions we're always asking ourselves, is, you know, like, is this an accurate depiction of the issue? Does the photo or video show a point of view that is dehumanizing? 
Um, for example, a photo that shows only a woman's torso with no head in the frame, does it or does it not reinforce stereotypes or dominant culture stories about marginalized people? And so I won't read all the questions on these slides, but I think to some degree you can get the gist in terms of the questions that we're asking. And so there's a way to make sure that we're considering this all the time. We're weaving this into our digital campaigns. And in fact, I'm gonna talk a bit more too about a tool that you can use that in fact, even if you might not know the word per se, it doesn't mean that you're probably not already using this in the word that you do right now. And that tool is called choice points. So what are choice points? Well, like I said, choice points, it's a tool, right? That helps us put our values above about equity into action in our campaigns. Choice points are opportunities to reflect, generate options and act on decisions that can impact equity and, and inclusion. In other words, put it bluntly, there is no neutral path, no decision is a decision. Um, so what you're seeing on the next slide right now um, is basically like, everything in life, you know, really comes down to a crossroads. And so just like in campaigns, digital or not, we find ourselves oftentimes at crossroads, decision-making points we can use to frame our campaigns and, and how our next steps can be differently. And so what you'll see is um, on one path, which is the autopilot, we can choose to do the things that we, that over time, um, that's the road that's often riddled with inequity, exclusion, and oppression, or we can choose to consciously answer those choice points questions and take the route that we know is more equitable, inclusive and practices. That means that in the campaigns that we're running and the stories that we're telling, we're not choosing the easy path out. We're on the way in terms of the issue that we're campaigning on. We're educating our list to make them more aware of the intersections of these issues and how it, and how it affects um, marginalized groups and communities. So that is really abstract, I know. And so, we're going to talk now about what that looks like in practice so you can get a better gist. And Fata is going to do just that. Yep. So thanks, Tony. I'll let you have a final look at this diagram and you can come back to it. Okay. So in practice, what does that mean? I'm going to use three examples of choice points we've used in the Palmo campaign on PepsiCo. So let me tell you a bit about Palmo before in case, you know, you know, like me and obsessed and you don't know everything about it. <laughs> Palmo is mostly produced, farmed, harvested, by people of color. Close to 90% of it is produced in Indonesia and Malaysia who dominate the, the market. And in Indonesia only, more than 25 million people depend on palm oil and the palm oil industry for their livelihood, okay? Now, oil palm, the trees that make, um, that make palm kernels with which we make palm oil, are six to 10 times more efficient at producing the oil than other crops such as Rapeseed, soybean, olive, and sunflower. You can make oil with all these crops, right? But it'll be six to ten times less efficient, meaning that you'll lose you'll use six to ten times more land, labor, etc. etc. Which means six to ten times more problems, right? Given all that, but some of us when we did this campaign, we made the conscious decision to never call for a boycott of palm oil. You might have seen people calling for a boycott of palm oil. Look on your product, snack, whatever. If there's palm oil, don't buy it. Well, that's one way to go. But at the end of the day, if everybody boycotts palm oil, the people who are going to be impacted directly are the people whose livelihood depend on palm oil. Not mine, not yours, not Tony's for what I know, right? People of color in the global south, people in Indonesia and Malaysia, the poorest of the population, usually single parents. So we made a conscious decision there. We were at a crossroad. We could have jumped on the boycott bandwagon or made a more conscious, more thoughtful decision based on inclusivity and equity and liberation. And that's a choice point there. This is an example of a choice point. Here's another one. If you think palm oil in campaigning, you think climate. Deforestation is a major contributor to emissions Obviously, we know that reducing deforestation is one of the key solutions to remediating to climate chaos. We also know that now. And on the other hand, most of the focus on the palm oil climate issues is on beautiful, cute, majestic orangutans. I love them, but only focusing on them, then what about displaced communities? What about land rights, land grab? What about workers' abuse and workers' rights? What about migrants' rights, which are usually workers' rights, because uh, a lot of migrant workers work in the palm oil industry. What about them? If you only look at the climate issue and the endangered animal um, and animal welfare angle, 
well, you forget about these people. In the PepsiCo campaign, we made the conscious decision, psst, here's another choice point there for you, to center the story of workers exploited on Palmo plantations. We talked about them. We amplified their voice. We didn't speak for them. We just took their demands and we brought them to the table along with the other demands, because for us it was as important. The reason why is because solely focusing on cute orangutans and devastated ecosystems would have been, yes, more engaging. We would have brought more money in fundraising. We would have had more press, more media. I probably would have been more on TV to talk about it because everybody cares about that. But it would have worsened the invisibilization of the workers. It would have made their case worse. And this was not acceptable for us. And this is why a choice point matters. This is why you see the crossroad and the two was really diverging. It really is not the same route you're taking. One goes towards liberation of all, the other one goes to short-term impact and very narrow view of keeping the status quo and being happy with it. And last one I wanted to share with you is more general, but very, very, very um, impactful as well. All along the way in that campaign, we checked in with partners, and I'm gonna name again our partners at RAM. Uh, and through them, through the partnership they had tied on the ground in Indonesia, we checked with partners on the ground. We made a conscious decision again not to move forward with tactics that mattered unless it was approved, you know, by the partners who were experts, by the partners on the ground. Nor did we call a final victory, because as I said earlier, when we started this, we won the campaign. We didn't call a final victory on this campaign until the affected communities and partners called a victory themselves. And this is very important. We could have called a victory way earlier, being like, we got the members, we, we, we wanted, we got the growth we wanted, we got the notoriety we wanted, I was in the news, we talked about it, it's a victory for us. Well, this is not what we wanted. We wanted to come, you know, for this to come from the people affected, the peop and as I said, when we do the prep, let's contact people affected, the groups affected, the people working on the issues first. Let's not do this last. This is very important, and this is a choice point you can make from the beginning and very early on in your work. Um, so these were three examples. There are many more we can we can give about this campaign and other campaigns we run. And I'm sure there are choice points you've made in the work you're doing or the work you've seen. Try to reflect a bit on this and think about what would be the other way? What is the alternative way we could go that is working towards liberation as well as taking us to that final goal that is the campaign victory goal? And you know, when you build the goals, try to also have goals that are, you know, with an NTO framing. That could be an, an entire other training or presentation, but you know, I'm leaving you with these, you know, bits th to, to think about, and I'll give uh, the mic back to Tony to, um, you know, sort of wrap it up before we go to question and, and answers and and do a quick review. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so just a quick overview as to like what we covered. Um, so digital campaigns are about leveraging and shifting power using online tools and tactics. Anti-O approach for liberation and impact and that choice points can be used to promote equity and inclusion. And one of the things we'll do when we share out those resources is we'll probably link to a couple of websites um, that will go in more details in terms of like how to think about choice points, if that's something that you're trying to apply more consistently um, to your work. Um, having said that, we are officially at the Q&A portion of the training. Uh, we have about, I wanna say 15. Yeah, almost 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah 15 minutes. Um, so, if you already are, Alex, I see your question um, in terms of the online games. If you have any more questions, uh, folks, please type that in the chat or you can stack and then we'll just call on you um, to share that. So Fata. Yeah, I can start with. This is the, yeah, the tactics portion. Yeah, yeah we can start with uh, Alex's question. Uh, and, if, and if we forgot one, please forgive us and please type it again if we haven't seen it. Um, and in the meantime, feel free to stack or type your question. So Alex, your question was, Online games, because it was a strategy and tactic. I, I put a tactic like online games. What does that mean? This is very interesting. We do less of it now, but we used to do more of it, and hopefully we'll get back to it. We, at some point around the year 2015, 16, experimented with gamification of the engagement of our supporters. What that means is, instead of having petitions or things to sign or videos to share, we tried to have them play a game and learn something from it and share it or take action after it. I can give you two examples, and I will add them to the resources I sent so you can actually play the games because they're still online. One was called the Weather App, and Tony yesterday reminded me that to this day people use it. It's something we sent to people in 2016, I think. 
It's a game where you go and you put your birth date, I think, and it tells you, um, what was it? Does it tell you the, the temperature yeah. or the concentration in, in carbon dioxide in the air was on your birth date? I believe it tells you both. It yeah. Should, it should tell you both, yeah. And so basically it was there and then it talks to you about climate chaos, climate deregulation and what you can do about it, right? And so that was an easy way for people to play a quick game online, some kind of quiz, and then get to uh, call to action. Another one that is my favorite we've ever done, and I'll put the link and you can play it, is an actual video game where with your mouse uh, on the screen, you could, so you had an orca in a tank, and you were to play with the orca in a tank. You could tell the orca where to go. The tank is very tiny, and the orca keeps on hitting their head on the walls of the tank. And after 30 seconds, one minute, you realize the game is very boring. And it takes you to talk about, yeah, the life of the orcas, being in captivity, in tanks, is very boring. They should not be in tanks. They should be in the ocean. And that is kind of the, you know, you could play the game for an hour if you wanted, but it would be very boring. And you would just keep on seeing an orca hurting themselves on the walls of a tank. So, and that game then led you to a call to action to take action on our SeaWorld petition back then, I think it was 2015, calling SeaWorld to end orca captivity. So this is an example of online games as tactics to win campaigns. Uh, but others have done it as well, and I'll try to find some others and add them to the resources. And just to add to what Tony said right before, we will add a lot of resources that will allow you to go much more in depth on everything we've covered whether it comes from us, from our partners, or from just online resources on these topics. So you can really go deeper. We have another question here from uh, Sybil. Uh, some of our supporters have asked about how effective it would be to directly email staff at companies, example, the sustainability rep, uh, with our demands. How much you contrast that tactic with visible communication like tweeting at them publicly? Curious to hear from your experience. Uh, Tony, you want to answer? You want me to answer? Let's tag team. Um, cool. Let's start. Go ahead. I will say directly emailing staff at companies as a tactic is super effective. In fact, we do that all the time with some of us. For us, we will labor that as a high bar action, uh, meaning that like after the folks have already signed a petition, that's something we do all the time. Um, in fact, yeah, like companies like hearing from consumers, especially and when they start to hear that like actually are the people that, you know, line our pockets are really upset. Um, they'll take that more seriously. Um, because I think over the years, now that there are bots and stuff, you can kind of manipulate more when when things trend. And so sometimes they'll probably take things not as seriously unless like, you know, someone that's verified, for example, like amplifies that that particular hashtag or like campaign. So I'll say in terms, like it depends, but oftentimes if you have, because sometimes it's really hard to get like the contact information for, for like um, staff at a company, but if you have that, see that as an asset and take advantage of that. They might block, like they blocked us a couple of times, but that just shows us that like we're, you know what I mean? Like that we're doing, that we're doing the necessary work to like piss them off. So in, yeah. I'll like, I'll live that bit. And Fata, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but see that as, to add. as an asset. You, you really, you, you said, you said it all. Um, the only thing I, I would add maybe is um, it also depends on where you're at in your strategy and your campaign. If in your strategy building, you identified the key people who have decision-making power, the influential ones, and you happen to have their email address, good for you go at it, right? Um, now, it could be that you're in a more diplomatic um, relationship with the target, and that happens, and it's fine. This is another strategy. You're more, you're less confrontational, and you're in a meeting with them, right? And you know tomorrow you have an in-person meeting with the VP of sustainability. Well, it could be a good idea to have a bit of a mess on Twitter right before the meeting, <laughs> and for his, his Twitter account to uh, be a very, very, very hot. That gives you a position of power maybe in the meeting. So you can use both. A lot of the things that Tony say, say, said are very relevant and super smart because now companies are thinking activists are activists. We don't have to listen to them, first of all. And they differentiate us from the customers uh, or the you know bottom line feeders. And they're thinking Twitter is not really representative anymore. It's manipulated conversation. So Use your best judgment on when you use both, but you can definitely use both. And, and Tony's advice is completely uh, relevant here and, and probably the best uh, on, on what to do. Next question from Nika is, which social media platform works best for digital organizing? Which one gets more engagement in your experience? Well, I can start with the answer and then Tony, I, I can give it to you. For us, let me start with, for us, it really has been 
Facebook has been like the main engine of growth engagement, really. Um, and I talk about growth because it's important. Whether you're talking about an organization like ours with millions of members or a community with 10, 15, 20, 30, maybe, growing is a very effective way to add weight, to add impact. So let's not dismiss that. So Facebook has been a good engine for us, but at the same time, Facebook has been a target of ours. So there's this contradiction and tension, right? So you have to play with that. Now, it really depends on who the target is. So again, if you look at the uh, analysis you're doing, what do they care about? You can ask yourself, which platform do they care the most about? Do they have a major follow? Like, is most of their following on Twitter or is it on Instagram? You hit them harder where they have the most of their eggs, right? If they put all their eggs in the same basket, this is the basket you're going to crash because this is where you're going to hurt them. Now, another thing is the audience. Who is your audience? Meaning, who are the people you want to reach, but also who are the people with the influence? Again, if you think back on the analysis. And it might be that, you know, it happens on TikTok. It might be that, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's on, on Twitter. It really depends. Um, I'd say Twitter is a very effective tool when you're trying to start a conversation, but Twitter does not seem to me to be the best digital tool in itself. It's a tactic more than like a platform where you can make things happen. Facebook for us has been better, but this is because of the way we operate. Tony, what do you what do you think? Yeah, I think I think it's it's exactly that. And also, um, we know that for us, a lot of our, our members are still on Facebook, and so we have to look at it too with a nuance. Like even if we do like tweet actions, that we know for to some degree that the engagement level would be low because not all of our members like you know have Twitter. So I think that's mm -hmm. something to keep in mind as well. But yeah, Facebook is definitely um, the one that we utilize the most. But I think. The answer to that question would vary depending on like the type of work that you do and like the, the, the communities that you're organizing, who you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. And some of the most impressive things I've seen recently um, did, not up, like, did not originate on those traditional historical platforms. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember their name, but the person who did a makeup tutorial to talk about the Chinese Uyghur situation, this is genius. And they were able to have all the news talk about the story, reach a lot of people on TikTok. And, you know, you could think like, how can I use TikTok for this? Well, you know, they did it and they proved that it's possible. So they're definitely, there's no frontier, basically. The, the sky is the limit on this. And for as long as you do a good analysis of where people that you're talking to are, where the people that the company cares about are, and you sort of look at that, you should, you should be able to, to use the right platform, which means you have to pretty much be everywhere. This is also what it means for you. Uh, <laughs> Although you'll see some of us is not really yet um, on some of the newest platforms. Uh, but we have an Instagram account. <laughs> do we, we have, have a TikTok, TikTok account? Do, I think yeah. we have a TikTok account. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're showing our it. age. <laughs> we um, do, do we, we have, have a couple question? more minutes? No, not yet. But just plug in that. We do have a couple more minutes that Fata and I you know, are happy to answer any more yeah. questions that folks might have. So if it's easier to type it, feel free to type it. Or you can just stack and then... Just ask your Defin question out loud. Definitely. And something else on questions is if you don't want to type it now or you, you can't think of anything or it takes you longer to think about a question, it's all fine. You will have our contact information at the end before we, we end the presentation. You can send us your questions to that. And what we'll do is if we have many questions, meaning more than one, but even one, I can do it. Um, for everybody to benefit from the answers, we can answer the, to the questions and then send that to everybody so that everybody benefits from whatever we had sent privately after the presentation. Because that's the cool thing about these Q&As is everybody benefits from both the questions and the answers. <coughs> we'll probably go another one or two minutes, see if uh, there are any other questions. And then we'll move on to sort of the final slide of this and, and wrapping up, which are the next steps, uh, although we've already teased it for you. <clears throat> Alex has another question. What top five hard skills, example, writing, social media, SEO, etc., would you recommend activists develop? 
That's a very good question. Um, <coughs> well, I'm going to assume you're talking about in the working on digital campaigns, right? Or at least, you know, digital or not, for me, a core skill really is something that works in any case is storytelling. And, you know, you said writing, writing is part of it. If you can tell a story the right way, you will touch people. People are touch, they're compelled to take action, right? So storytelling is really a, a core skill that I encourage everybody to sort of look at and, and pay a, a bit more attention to. And then obviously everything that has to do with social media and the ever rapidly uh, changing and evolving landscape of social media and, and new technologies is definitely something I would encourage you to look at. So storytelling, including writing, obviously, um, social media, uh, and then really depends on your like strengths and skills you already have. When it comes to you know SEO referencing and, and, and all that, it depends on what you want to do. I would say yes, Facebook ads, for example, and Google ads. This is something that helps you bring in people into your campaigns. Uh, but that's really if you're in that position. And usually, you know, uh, most of the organizations that do this kind of work are segmented in the way they ask people to do work. For example, Tony and I are in campaigners positions, meaning we do fundraising, campaigning. So we do the storytelling and all that. We do the tech work of setting up the tech and all that, but we don't really do the Facebook ads. Some of our colleagues are doing it, right? So it really depends on where you work then. I know workplaces that are even more segmented where campaigners only develop the campaigns. And then you have digital folks who bring them to the digital realm, right? So, you know, uh, it's not it's not complete, but uh, Tony, do you have other advice or things you think are, are core skills that you would recommend? Um, I honestly feel like you covered a good chunk of it. I don't really have five. Um, but I'll say for sure, like, I found it beneficial, you know, for me, especially as, as a black person to skill up really hard on, on these skills, i.e. write in. So knowing how to, you know, write fundraisers or just call to action, um, thought to like touch on it a bit, uh, a bit, but I can also say, uh, understanding how to read data or data, however you want to pronounce it. Like that, that can also like set you up pretty solidly because then you can kind of look at the information and see like what's performing well. Uh, or like if you want to do an A-B test to like, you know, test your messaging to see how it's performing, um, for example, like to your list or like even in person, you know, if you do like grassroots organizing and you like you write a call script or, or for example, you can kind of get a sense. It's like which script might get people to open up more about whatever issue you're talking about. So like that's like a in the field, like A-B test kind of thing. But yeah, I will say the writing for sure is, is like top, like the, the top one, um, especially if you can transfer um, the call to action into a fundraiser that makes you, that makes you really appealing because, you know, in order to do the work that you want to do to some degree, like it is going to take money. And if you can convince people why they shouldn't give or like why they should believe in your cause, then, then you're on the money. And also if you want to get hired to like, you are being the full package. Yep, definitely. Um, thank you very much. Again, please do not hesitate to send us your questions if you didn't think of them uh, in time or if you just wanted to keep them private, we can also keep the answer private. So feel free. Uh, on to next steps. So basically, the main thing that will happen is through uh, SCAD, which I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing the name of that platform, right? But it's an amazing platform. I will email you, meaning the people who've signed up for the session, a list of resources that will allow you to go deeper uh, into some of the topics we've covered. Also just have the resources at hand, the diagrams, the tools, the things, um, explainers. So I'll send you a list of this. Also a list of, of uh, URLs you can visit, including some of the games we've talked about, uh, some of us as community petition platform, um, you know, where you can start your own petition if you need to start a petition, uh, a bunch of resources that I can send you. Second is, it really, it really is optional. It's an exercise if you wanna sort of put to application what you've learned today, you can use this training and sort of go through it and, and pick a target and build a campaign strategy and see how that works, you know, um, if you've never done it or if you needed inspiration, use that. Um, we love feedback. So either send it via email or through the platform sked and send us the feedback. There's an option there. If you don't find it, send us an email and we're happy to get that. Uh, and again, if you have any question, any comment, anything you want to say, uh, you can contact us. Our contact info is on the last slide, and uh, there it is. 
uh, and you know you have the presentation any way you can find it. Email format is simple, fata at some of us or Tony at some of us, and it's the same thing for most companies. Last tip, <laughs> you know, if you find one person's email, you have everybody's email because it follows the same format for everybody. Um, and that's us at the hour. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. everyone.